Welcome back to another edition of the On the Board Sports Podcast. I am your host, Will Trucci, a.k.a. Will See. Coming to you from Long Island, New York, in my basement. I got the gym equipment set up back over here, but, you know, we're doing what we're doing right now. I'm growing out the, the beard. It's not a playoff beard, but I know my co-host is growing out his beard for a very long time. Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Shawnee on the mic. He's in Queens, New York right now, a little, little west of me. Sean, how are you? Well, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I um, hope all is well with you, sir. How are you doing, pal? I'm hanging in. Can't complain. But, you know, we have a very special guest joining us from Los Angeles, California, is the one and only Steve Weish of the NFL Network. Steve, it's an honor to have you on. Thank you for coming on. How are you? I'm doing great, man. William and Sean, thanks for having me on. I love this kind of coast-to-coast flow <laughs> we've got going on right here, you know, in New York, L.A., you know. Rocking the mic, Definitely. like some old school hip hop battle days going on. Right. But no, this is great, man. I really appreciate you guys having me on. That was really cool for Sean to reach out and you guys to reach out. I'm excited to do this. Absolutely. Steve. Thank you so much. And, you know, we, we really appreciate this. Uh, Steve, before we talk NFL, how did you start up in, in news writing and in mm-hmm. media? Because it's, it's an interesting story. You, you got to the NFL Network about, what, 10 years ago? And now you, you, you're doing what you're doing. How, how did you get into doing what you love right now? Yeah, I'm, I'm almost at my 12th season at the NFL Network. I'm a dinosaur uh, at our, in, in, our, in our company. No, I mean, I started a long time. It goes back to high school. Um, you know, it, it was – I couldn't do math. I couldn't do science. And I wasn't very good at a lot of other things. I was like, you know what, I can't I – can't, I'm not going to go to college and be a business major. Let, let's get that straight now. I was always a very good writer. Love classes like social studies and history. Love to read and you know this and that. So I was like, let's let's find a writing profession. Um, was an athlete. Love sports. Uh, my father. I grew up in St. Louis. My father was the head of the, of the sales department at the NBC affiliate there. So I was always around the news industry and a lot of the personalities that were there. So I was like, you know, this is this is kind of the path I want to take. So after high school, I went to University of Missouri to play football for a couple of years. And their journalism school is like very difficult, very hard to get into. And my grades weren't good enough while I was playing football to get in. So I was like, I don't know if this is going to happen. So I transferred schools. Um, You know, I knew I wasn't good enough to get to the NFL. So I transferred to Howard University in Washington, D.C. And um, started pursuing journalism there and was able to get on the newspaper staff there. as first sports editor, then the editor in chief. While I was there, I, I, this was the cool part is, you know, I got a part-time job at the Washington Post covering high school football games on Fridays and then high school basketball games twice a week. And they liked what I was doing. They appreciated my grind, allowed me to write some features and things like that and kind of continue on. So by the time I graduated and I started applying to places, um, they saw that Washington Post thing on my, on my resume. You know, they saw that work experience. And so I was able to get hired, worked in Richmond, Virginia. Um, for a while. So from Richmond, through my years in Miami, and uh, Atlanta, and, wa- and back in Washington, D.C., it was about a 20-some year career. I was a writer, you know, and I've covered everything, except for Major League Baseball and the NHL. I was a longtime NBA guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and then when I got to Atlanta, you know, I was covering the Falcons, and that's where everything kind of happened. And it, it, the big Michael Vick dogfighting coverage that my partner, Daryl Ledbetter, who's still the Falcons beat writer, and I did, um, really brought me a lot of national attention. And, and so that's when the NFL Network came calling. Mm, gotcha. That's an amazing story, Steve. That's an amazing... Um, learn how to write. Learn how to write. You see us on TV. You see us... To, if, you can learn, if you can write, you'll have the backbone of journalism. You'll have, you'll have to understand how to ask questions because as a writer, you have to paint a picture for someone rather than show them the video of it. So learn how to write if you want to have longevity in this game. Amen to that. Amen to that. Yep. Steve, let's take it to the football field now. Um, yep. The NFL draft was out about uh, two weeks ago. Obviously, with everything going on, it was the first ever uh, virtual draft. What are your thoughts on how the draft went? And I know this won't be something that happens if, um uh, future wise, but just your take on how the whole uh, three days went uh, with the draft. Well, I, you know, frankly, it went off without a hitch based on all the circumstances everybody was faced with from the league not being able to have, you know, one central location where it could operate and have, you know, draft picks in the green room and things like that to 
the players and their families being at home and, you know, and just, just the way the teams function. We didn't hear about any technical issues that blew up a trade or caused confusion on getting information in. So, I mean, I think that way was fantastic. And I really think the television viewer appreciated seeing, you know, Joe Burrow just kind of sitting in kind of a modest living room with his parents getting picked or seeing Tua Tunga Vailoa at this kind of big estate home down in Alabama on a lake with his parents sitting there in all of their Polynesian gear. I mean, I really think that home feel, um, you know, really struck struck you know, a chord with a lot of the families. So overall, it went well. Now, we'll see how these teams, how their actual picks pan out in a couple of years. But, but this took scouts. I mean, this is this is what the scouts love because this made them the central point. You know, a lot of times when you have these, these in-facility visits or a lot of these interviews in person, a coach or team personnel that hasn't scouted these guys at practice, you know, while they were in college, like they get overwhelmed, like, oh, I love this kid. We have to draft this kid. And it might not be the best person for your team. Well, those people who normally can have that influence had to be sidelined and listen to their scouts this year who said, look, I've got people in Tuscaloosa and I've got people, you know, in Athens, Georgia, whatever, who yeah. tell me this about this kid, or I've seen him at practice and he's a lot better on game film than he is that you see at practice. So don't get caught up in this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so that's where I think this is going to be really cool to see what teams have really adept scouting departments, and which ones don't. Absolutely. And Steve, you know, you mentioned, you, know, you talk about the NFL draft and my, I, my, I'm wearing a jet, my Jets gear right now. I'm a diehard Jet fan, season ticket holder, the, the works, okay? I love my Jets. How did, the both, how did both New York teams do, both the Jets and the Giants in the NFL draft this year? Hey, you know what? Talking to, talking to NFL people, they think both of them did really well. I mean, they, they addressed areas they had to. We know the offensive line. They've got young quarterbacks, but they've got to take care of. And, and they, they got great players, you know, the Jets – getting Beckton, who they say is going to be, a, a, you know, just a road grader and doing some other things in free agency mm -hmm. to fortify the trenches. And if you look at how teams that have really, you know, had young quarterbacks succeed, even if these quarterbacks weren't great players, they got them good offensive linemen, good running backs, okay? Maybe not the greatest of receiving threats, but eventually that comes. But if they can run the ball – milk clock, and then have a defense, may not be the stoutest defense in the world, but a defense that can get takeaways mm -hmm. to get the ball back to that running game to milk clock. Mm -hmm. You know, look what the Titans did last year. I mean, so, so things like that. And that's what both teams have done. They set out. They didn't get caught up in this or that, the splash and all that. Let's get back to winning football games on the interior. Look at the two teams in the Super Bowl. We can talk about Patrick Mahomes and Jimmy G and all that they are built along their offensive and defensive front. So, again, this is talking to folks in the NFL who think both teams really, really did well. I think the Giants are a little bit further back than the Jets are. I think the AFC East is a little bit more wide open, as crazy as that sounds. But with Tom Brady gone and the Patriots lose some pieces, I think that's a little bit more wide open than the NFC East. But, look, it's a process. And if you want to succeed with the young quarterbacks, it looks like both of these teams finally – got their footing and look I, I know you're a Jets fan folks around this league love Joe Douglas he is so respected in personnel in the personnel circles they're like he is gonna he's gonna get that organization mm. back to where it needs to be mm. absolutely so there you go William you good you happy now you done <laughs> yeah this gifts yeah. already opened up I'm, I'm good man I'm all right <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing Steve you mentioned uh, the Titans, and that is my team. I've been a huge uh, Titan fan for like about the past 20 or uh, some odd years. Wait, 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 wait. How, wait, you're in Queens? I'm in Queens, New York, yeah. Okay, so how in the world did that happen? All right, so Steve, so I know you can't tell, but I'm kind of like a big guy, but I've never been this big. So I actually played quarterback, and my favorite player was Air McNair, Steve McNair. Okay. Uh, God... Uh, 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 rest his soul. Steve McNair, that was my guy. So I kind of just was like, oh, and then the first ever Super Bowl I sat down and watched was when the one yard line, Steve, he almost had it when they lost uh, to the Rams. 
we almost had it. Just one more yard. <laughs> so yeah, man. But um, Steve, my question for you is, as you said, Henry was the heart of that team. Mm -hmm. But my question is, we've seen the running back position get devalued throughout the past like five years, 10 um, uh, um, seasons to the point where you have it's teams here that have like undrafted guys, like the two teams in uh, the Super Bowl yep. starting. So it's just like, why do you feel like the running back position is so low when about five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you had um, um, uh, Martin and Terrell Davis and Sean Alec, mm -hmm. Xander, so on and so forth. Well, it's too bad. First off, the running back position itself has not been devalued. It's an important position. The running back has been right. devalued. Right, okay, right. Position-wise, the 49ers are a run-first football team. Everything they do is set up off of the run. Okay, a lot of teams, the Rams, as many yards as they put up, in a split, they are a run-first football team. Play action is how their quarterbacks function. Right. So let's make that distinction. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of the big bell cow running back, I think – that that part's been devalued because of the shelf life, right? We've seen running backs have three and four really good years. Like Derrick Henry, quietly, has had three really good years. Last year was not his first big year. It was the first year he led the NFL in rushing. But they they tend after the year four and year five, you know, that curve starts coming down. Whereas other positions, such as quarterback, these guys are playing into their forties now. Right. Um, wide receivers, you know, they're playing into their, their early to mid thirties now. So I think it's that individual running back. Plus the game is now geometry, right? You go back, you go, even go to high school, these, these kids, elementary school, youth leagues, these guys are playing these seven on seven leagues. They're playing in space. Quarterback's not getting under center. So it is all about spacing with receivers, angles, things like this. The running back is kind of a luxury in those offenses. So from a young age, kids are learning to play quarterback like you. They're learning to play wide receiver. They're learning to play tight end. They're learning to play DB. Okay, so that that's where things have shifted. Because just football back in the day, like when I played, it was run, run, run. Even quarterbacks, it was run, run, run. So, so that's where it, it's all shifted. I mean, even look at the value of the nickel corner and how that now is, is, is almost more valuable than safeties in mm -hmm. a lot of teams. Right. So, and that's all again to play. The game is in space, man. It, it's all geometry. So, the position of running back is highly valued. The value of the individual running back, that's where things have come down. Gotcha. Gotcha. Speaking of value, you mentioned Tom Brady earlier. Mm -hmm. What's your thoughts on Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski going over to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? Yeah, and, I mean, and the new good. What, what do they do from here? Oh, that's what you want to know. <laughs> they're Jets fan. You want to know if they're done. That's what that's all about. <laughs> um, well, you know, well, you know, let's start with that. Yeah. I think this is everybody is waiting like, okay, this is finally the end. We knew it either had to be Brady or Belichick to go before the, the, the scales balanced for the rest of the division, which is basically just been waylaid for a decade and a half, if not two. <laughs> um, so I think the Patriots are going to take a step back. Um, we can talk about Jared Stidham, how much they love him, this and that. I think if he had a full off season to really get the reps and do everything that he needed to do, it would be easier for him to learn. I mean, Josh McDaniels is a brilliant developer, um, you know, to learn, you know, but those guys aren't together. He's not with Nikhil here. He's not with some of these receivers they want him to grow with. So it's going to be tough. Defensively, they're still going to be good, but they lost some good players on that defense too. I mean, Kyle Van Oye is down in Miami. There's some good players who left. So, you know, I think Buffalo is a team in the division that's really on the on the rise. They had an outstanding draft, even though they didn't have a first-round draft pick. They added Stephon Diggs. But to, you know, get Mario Addison, a defensive end, a free agent, and A.J. Epinesa, I mean, they got some guys who can get after it. Got problems. So they're, they're going to be uh, a team that's tough to handle. As for the Buccaneers, my big question isn't so much him learning a new system and things like that. It's, it's the age factor. You know, we, we see these, these quarterbacks play older, but at some point, I mean, it, it comes on you like a stack of bricks. It, it came on me. I'm 53 now, and I wake up some mornings like I've been in a car crash. Hey. Now, I don't train like Tom Brady. I, I don't diet like Tom Brady. He is just an unbelievable specimen, and I do not doubt him. He is a la I think they're going to be better than they have been. 
Um, I think adding Rob Gronkowski, besides him being fresh and healthy and all this and that, where he's going to be important early on, is he's going to be telling all these other players who have not had a chance to work with Brady and who are going to come in like, oh, my God, is Tom Brady. Like, okay, here are the things Tom likes. Here's some of his online checks, some of the real nuances and intricacies of things that Tom Brady's going to bring to that team. He's going to help a lot of these players understand because they've, they've never been around a competitor like him. No matter what you say, Tom Brady is, is, is off the charts. That said, the Saints are still the team to beat in that division. They are a great team, a well-coached team. The fact they added Emmanuel Sanders to that offense, Sean Payton right now is sitting around just playing pin the tail on the touchdown <laughs> as he's planning on how many points he's going to score when he faces the rest of the NFL this year. Right. Yes, yeah, Steve, man, that's very true. Steve, so with free agency and trades, so on and so forth, is there a specific – the vision that you are particularly interested in seeing those gains? Because as you said, Brady's now out of the AFC East. So the AFC East, all four teams there, the NFC South now, Brady is now there. Is there a particular division or two that you just can't wait to see how that division goes? Well, yeah, I mean, first off, the NFC South. I mean, it's loaded. It always is loaded. People, you know, because these aren't big market teams in New Orleans and Atlanta and Carolina, you know, it, pe people are like, okay, the, these aren't, you know, the big market teams. But Tampa Bay, you know, you've got – so you're, you're, you've got Brady, Breeze, Teddy Bridgewater, and Matt Ryan, okay? So you've got all these quarterbacks in the division. You've got very, very good coaching in this division, top to bottom. It is thick. And then if you look at their schedule, I mean, if you guys want to have some fun, go look at the opponents that the NFC South has to play. Kansas City, Green Bay, the Vikings, the Chargers. If you look at the Buccaneers' home schedule, I mean, it is – I'm like, man, if these guys get to 10 games and they have earned it. If they get 10 <laughs> wins, they've earned it. It is a brutal, brutal schedule that the South has to play outside of the division. Right. So you've got that. And then I think, you know, uh, another division that I'm really kind of looking at is the AFC North. Because right now it really looks like the Ravens are in the driver's seat, as they should be. But what are the Steelers going to be with Big Ben coming back? I mean, we see how valuable he is. Can the Browns finally play up to all of that talent? I mean, they're there. I mean, I think, you know, you've got to give the Bengals and Joe Burrow a, a pass this year. It's going to be really tough for a rookie to come in under these circumstances. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's some intriguing, you know, matchups there in, in the AFC North. Because I think people are going to look at the Ravens along with the Chiefs as the teams to beat in the AFC right now. Mm, that's very interesting right there. You know, AFC North for years has been – the toughest division, one of the toughest divisions anyway, in all of football. Steve, I know that we're limited on time, but tomorrow is the selection for the NFL, you know, for, for the schedule. The schedule Steve, release, yeah. What it was looking like uh, for the 2020 year. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, A? And B, you know, with everybody being in quarantine right now, you know, with the doc, you said you covered basketball for a little bit. What are your thoughts on the Last Dance documentary? All right. So first of all, let's go to the schedule release. I mean, this, this is crazy because we just don't know. We honestly don't know. So a lot of people are like, oh, the NFL is tone deaf for releasing its schedule. But they were saying the same thing about it. They're tone deaf about having agency. That went off fine. Everyone loved it. And it gave us sports star star fans content and conversation pieces. Same with the draft. So the schedule release, look, the NFL's got to put it out. And it will adjust if it needs to be, whether it's no fans, whether they've got to lop some games off, whether they have to push things back a month. I mean, we're all in uncharted territories in our lives. We just do not know. I think there will be a season of some sort. Um, so I'm interested to see, you know, I think that the back half of the schedule for everybody is going to be loaded with division games. Um, we know the international games are coming back domestically. So those teams get home games back. So that's good for those fan bases. Yes. Um, so I, I'm just, look, you're going to see the Buccaneers. You're going to see the Buccaneers on TV more than you've seen them on TV. Of course, the Chiefs and Saints right. are going to be hot ticket teams, as will the Cowboys. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be an interesting team now that they got C.D. Lamb. So that would be great. As far as the last dance, this is the bomb. So 
I covered the NBA during the back half of the Bulls run. So, you know, the actual last dance part of it, the early part, I was covering college football in the NFL. Um, but I know all the characters. I mean, I know Michael Jordan. I, I covered the NBA in Washington when he, when he came back to run the Wizards and then finished his career playing for them. So I know a lot about him and, and how he operates and a lot of things they're saying. You know, I, I went through all this stuff with Rodman and Pippen and, and all these guys working because Miami, the Miami Heat were one of the teams that were knocking on the Bulls' door. It was the Heat, it was the Knicks, it was the Magic trying to get beyond the Bulls in the East. And that's back when the Eastern Division, the NBA, was like the Western Division is now. Just brutal, just a gauntlet to get there. I mean, the Nets were good. The Raptors were good. I mean, all these teams were really, really strong. Pistons were still good. The Milwaukee Bucks were good. So it, it's just really cool watching this. It is really well done. I think a lot of people felt because Michael Jordan had so much editorial control that it was going to be a, a puff piece on Michael Jordan. But we're seeing a lot of the raw stuff with Rodman and Phil Jackson and, and Jerry Krause. Just a lot of great behind-the-scenes stuff that we all wish we could get in the NBA. And in terms of Michael Jordan, you have no idea how big of a star he is. We think all these guys in the NFL, Odell Beckham, these guys are legendary. You cannot compare – the only other person right now you could probably compare, you know, Michael Jordan to is LeBron James, where they just cannot make a move without people come running out of restaurants and things like that. And that's how it was covering Jordan. It was just – you had to be tireless because he is just up here in the stratosphere of celebrity. So I'm loving it. I'm looking forward to, you know, to the next couple series. And I, I – look, I give credit to ESPN and all these documentaries they do because they just keep knocking it out of the park over and over with some of the access they've been able to generate and just the quality of material they've been able to produce. That's so true. That's so true. Steve, my last question for you is, Steve, as you know, the NFL Network, like you said, you're coming up on 12 solid uh, seasons now. Can you just tell me and well and everybody, how much of a joy has it been working there for the 12 years? When you look to your left, there's a Hall of Famer to your left. There's a Hall of Famer to your right. There's a former player everywhere. Just how much... Just how great and is it I'm working with? Look, I live my dream. I mean, there's a lot of people when they're young who want to do what I do, but they end up not being able to go to college or, um, you know, they, they major in this, but they can't catch a break. They're just as talented or just as hardworking, but they just couldn't catch that break. Like I said, I was fortunate enough to work at the Washington Post in college to get that break. And, and, I, and I tell this over and over every day. There's not a day that goes by when I don't wake up and say 50 million people want my job. If I'm not feeling well or if I'm grumpy or whatever and I've got to run here and do this. I think about the days when I was, you know, in, in summer, uh, you know, summer at home between colleges when I'm lifting railroad ties out of people's gardens because they were treated with this, um, this illegal uh, finish called creatine. Mm -hmm. So I spent a whole summer in the sun doing that, like that's work. And there are people who are doing that for a living. What I have right now is gravy, right? <laughs> it, it's, it's hard work. I won't say that it's, it's a grind and this and that. Working is labor. Working is what our nurses and doctors and firefighters and flight attendants and grocery store workers and everybody's doing now amid this COVID disease, our police officers are, that's work, Right. Mm -hmm. So I grind doing what I'm doing, but, you know, I'm fortunate to be where I am. Like you said, there's Hall of Famers there. There's Hall of Fame producers and just great people. That's been the best part. I mean, Kurt Warner, he's the real dude. He's everything you, you, you know, you've heard about. He's legit. Terrell Davis, um, you know, my old colleague, Marshall Falk. There's just so many great people I work with. My guy, James Jones and Mike Robinson, my two dudes, Willie McGinnis, that's my guy. It's great to work with these people, but then it's great also in the industry to go see guys like Lewis Riddick or Dan Orlovsky and, and Stephen A. Smith, all those guys from ESPN or my guys over at Fox. Right. These are all people I've crossed paths with along my journalism career in some way, shape, or form. So I'm blessed. I count every day um, as good fortune. And hopefully, you know, what I do and what we do at the network, we bring some relief to people during times like this or during other stressful times in their lives. Uh, because we understand that's what we're here for and that's what you know we put first it is not us I want to be that star this and that most of these guys have been started we, the fans are our stars the fans are who keep us going and that's why we try our best to deliver everything that we can when we can 
Amen. Amen. That's awesome. Yep. Uh, Steve, how do people follow you on social media? It's a big tool nowadays. It really is. It's a big, it, it's, it's a big tool. A lot of people think that uh, I'm a big tool on social media, <laughs> you know, the way that they come after me sometimes. <laughs> but it is Weich89, W-Y-C-H-E-89. That's the Twitter handle and the IG handle. Don't come at me at Facebook. That is personal. That's what I keep for my people. <laughs> yes. But, you know, the, the Weich89 is, is, is where you can find me. My Instagram handle is a little bit more. Of course, the photos, the fun stuff. But I put a lot of work stuff up there. Twitter's a lot of work. But uh, I have a lot of fun. And I will tell people, and it's in my bio, don't respect my dojo. Because if you come for me, you're getting something. All that's right. right. <laughs> that's, how, that's, that's how I operate. Don't let the smooth taste fool you, brother. <laughs> You're always prepared, Steve. You're always prepared. That's, You're that's always the prepared, exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Steve, man, this has been such a pleasure. We know you got to run. Thank you so much for giving me and Will Thank some you. time. I watched. That's great. Yeah, man. Uh, that I watch the NFL network often, often, often. And it's, and like Will said, it's been. And an honor, man. So thank you so much. Thank you. And continue to be well and be safe, bro. One last thing. This better not be the last time you have me on, gentlemen. No. Better not be the last time. We, we got to circle want. back, man. You guys are great. Come back anytime yes, you want. We, anytime you want, Steve. Anytime you want. All right, guys. All the best. And stay safe. All right, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you, Steve. You got it. Appreciate it. That was Steve Weiss of the NFL Network. Will, that was a thrill. That was an amazing time, man. Steve, it's Awesome, awesome, awesome people, man. Yes, absolutely. Steve is one of the true, truer gentlemen that you could go out and you could just have a conversation with. He knows what he's talking about. And listen, he even said it best. Don't step in the dojo without being prepared. You know, that's right. <laughs> he goes out there and he does he does everything well and to a T, 110%. Uh, the man is just flat out awesome. And what more can you want? He's living his dream. And that's something that as human beings, like, oh, you know, he said it. He's one in 15 million people that are doing, doing a job that's right. absolutely incredible. And right. he's doing it at such a high level. Kudos to him for actually going out there and doing it on days in which he doesn't really feel well or right. doing that, you know, trying to give the boss, like, uh, you know, an extra, an extra card in their pocket to say, hey, right. you know, listen, next thing you know, that's it. So he doesn't give that extra ammunition. He's always hardworking, and it's great to have him on. And it was great to just talk football and even about the last dance since he covered basketball. He covered basketball, right. Really amazing stuff. So That was a great one, Will, right. It was. So, so uh, Sean, do uh, you have any final thoughts on, uh, on this episode? No, Will, just awesome job by you again. Thank you, for Steve, for uh, coming on. Um, and what, peop well, uh, what I think people don't realize is even though these – reporters and journalists and columnists blah 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 even though they're at home they're still busy man like, yeah oh yeah even there's no sports going on there is sports going on so steve is a busy guy like the reason why um uh he had to go was because he has another one of these to go and do so yep, that's just right. thankful for steve for giving us yeah sacrificing the, uh, some time thank you steve for sacrificing some time i know it's been, been a great episode so uh, yeah, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, really, I have no other final thoughts here other than I just want to see what, what the Jets are going to get as far as their 2020 schedule goes. You know, yeah. um, so that's going to be really interesting. And I know you're hyped up for your Titans, and I know many people are hyped up for their respective teams, for their respective schedules as well. Right. So it's definitely going to be a very interesting, interesting time right. in the world of the NFL. For every – one other thing, I know I didn't really mention it, but shout out to all the essential workers out there going out there. And I know I mention this every episode. I, we didn't at the beginning because we had the great Steve Weish, but shout out to all the essential workers, whether you are a cop, a fireman, an EMT worker, a construction worker, a fast food worker, a grocery store worker, a nurse, a doctor, uh, or any, anybody else that's deemed essential. Even a postal worker, they're deemed essential as well. That's true. Thank you guys for making our lives, A, easier, B, you know, just, just thank you for doing you. 
You guys are awesome with a capital A. I know I'm, listen, Sean, I'm an electrician. I am deemed technically essential. Right. But because of my certain circumstance, being on a job that is deemed non-essential, mm. uh, that's why I'm home and that's why I have the gym in the background right now. So, <laughs> all right. So you just got to go out there and just do it, you know? But yeah, Amen. shout out to all those essential workers though, for sure. Amen. Amen. Well, and for everybody here on the On the Board Sports Podcast, for the wonderful Steve Weish of the NFL Network, thank you again for coming on. We really appreciate you. For my wonderful co-host, Sean Thomas, a.k.a. Shawnee on the mic, I am your host, William Trucci, a.k.a. We'll see you logging out. We will talk to you guys soon. Be safe, be healthy, and God bless all of you. Peace out.